today's video, we want to look at an airport. Most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the St. Clair County Airport, which you can see here. This airport was dedicated October 20th, 1951, and this is a paper from the following day, the 21st. And you can see a photograph of the dedication, uh, aerial view anyway, and the caption reads, Visitors gather around the speaker's platform as preparations are begun for formal dedication of the new St. Clair County Airport Saturday. The ceremony was conducted in front of the new administration building at the field. Governor G. Menon Williams had just arrived in the twin engine plane near the center of the paved area. And you can see it here as we zoom in. On this next page, you can see the scenes at the dedication of the new county airport as the headline suggests. And the very first photograph at the top are members of high school bands from throughout St. Clair County that march together uh, over the plain parking apron to take part in the dedication of the new airport. And the photo just below that, you can see Governor Men and Williams addresses a crowd from the speaker's platform in front of the administration building on the field. And then over to the right, you can see a formation of military planes flying over the airport during the dedication. So it was a pretty big deal. This is the only airport that much of our local population is even aware of. But this isn't the airport that we want to look at today in this video. The one that we want to look at is on the north end of town. Port Huron Township to be exact. This is that area looking down from the satellite view and before we get into the history of this area, uh, look at the difference in Black River uh, from below the canal and above the canal. So anyone that thinks that the fresh water coming into Black River doesn't make a difference only needs to look at this picture. All right, let's get back to uh, Bakersfield. Today, that area is occupied by Bakersfield Park, which is kind of an unusual name unless you know the history of this area. There is a hint on this sign, though. If you look on the upper left-hand corner, you see a picture of an airplane. And yes, this used to be an airport, Bakersfield Airport. The airfield was named after this man, Harold J. Baker. Mr. Baker was born in 1902 on a farm in Clyde Township and dropped out of Port Huron High School in the 10th grade. He learned basic engineering and design through a learn by mail class soon after he left school. He became a self-taught engineer. And for never going to college for being an engineer, Mr. Baker's resume was quite impressive. His first job was in the engineering department and the Port Huron Engine and Thresher Company. He would later go on to work for Mueller Brass Company as an engineer and the Hupmobile Company in Detroit. He would also go on to help design the engines for the Will St. Clair automobiles that were made in Marysville. And then he turned to his true passion, which was boating, and became an engineer for the DeWight Boat Company in River Rouge and later would go on to become the chief engineer at Chris Craft in Algonac. He then went on to purchase about 60 acres of land at the end of Strawberry Lane. And then, do you know what he built there? No, not an airport. He built a boat company, the Emma Road Boat and Manufacturing Company to be exact, which was named after his wife, Emma. Here you see a picture of his company and uh, the caption says that uh, as 6,000 square feet in buildings equipped for overhauling, repairing, and refinishing, and servicing all makes and types of pleasure craft, as well as storing in the off season. And as we zoom in here, you can see uh, the signage on the right it says the Emerald Boat Manufacturing Company. And then over on the left, it says Black River Yacht and Drone, Yacht Drone. Now that confused me because I don't know what a drone is. I know what a drone is, but not a drone. And so I had to look it up. And this is what it says, denoting a place for running or racing. Well, Mr. Baker was heavily involved in racing. 
In fact, Baker founded the Black River Boat Club at the marina and won racing trophies with the 26-foot powerboat Emma Road that he designed and built in 1931. The caption on this photograph says, Smiles came easily for Harold J. Baker on the right and Louis Foster on the left, members of the winning crew in the Port Huron Yacht Club speedboat race Saturday from Port Huron to Harsons Island on St. Clair River. Baker, owner, piloted his craft down the 30-mile river run in 45 minutes, 40 seconds, less than his estimated time, which gave him the Times Herald Trophy and also the Alvin Winkleman Award for the first boat to finish. There were 10 owners that had boats in the race. In this photograph here, taken the same year, which was 1941, under the title of Emma Road Boat Company, has staff of experts to service pleasure craft. Complete service is provided owners by firm. And in this photo, the caption says this. Three members of the Emma Road Boat and Manufacturing Company are shown as a consultation over a six-speedboat motor. Left to right are George Bruin, specialist for the firm in outboard motorboat service. Harold J. Baker, the busy genial proprietor manager of the company. And Jack Beebe was with late Harold Chris C. Smith in the pioneer days when the forerunners of the present Chris Craft were built and who has been around speedboats and pleasure craft all his life. Mr. Baker, being an astute businessman, wanted the city to dredge the canal make it so pleasure boats could come right off Lake Yarn, right into Black River, and coincidentally, to his business. But that never happened. In 1950, Mr. Baker was instrumental in getting the work on the bypass bridge stopped. He got a restraining order prohibiting the State Highway Department for putting the missing center span in the new bypass bridge over Black River. Mr. Baker said finishing the bridge would keep tall mass boats from going upriver to his boat repair and storage yards. Of course, we all know you can't have a bridge without a center span, so he failed in that attempt. It seemed a little late to put up a fuss since both sides were already built. All they had to do was put the center in. Seemed like he would have complained long before that, or maybe he did. But you can see his concern. It was going to cause a, a loss of business for him. Baker's Boat Company was started about 1936. The St. Clair County Airport, although the dedication was in 1951, the airport was actually started in 1946. But before that, in 1938, Baker started his airport, Baker's Field. The airport was actually started by a group of aviation enthusiasts of which Baker was a part. This group was called Baker's Black River Flyers. In this article, a friend of Baker says that Baker wasn't a pilot and didn't take to the skies often. He says, I think I gave him a ride once or twice. Baker spent his time building boats as part of his boat building company, the Emma Road Boat and Manufacturing Company, named after his wife, Emma. And I think that's where his first love was. Later on in an article by John Brown, I said that Baker was a pilot. So perhaps he got his pilot's license later. In this article, it says Bakersville turned out to be Michigan's first licensed airport. It also turns out it was the most easterly airport in the state of Michigan. This article says Bakersfield, the most easterly airport in Michigan, is a convenient stopover point for planes flying between Michigan and Ontario. This licensed Class 1 airport is an approved port of entry, and customs and immigration officials are on hand. It goes on to say flight training, charter, and freight service are offered at Baker's Field, a water taxi service to enable pilots to reach downtown Port Huron, or the beaches by boat, is planned. The proximity of Baker's Field to Lake Huron beaches enables inland residents of Michigan to fly here for a weekend of boating. The boat company and the airport were in close proximity of each other. You can see from this uh, photo here of the uh, boat company. If you look closely in the background, you see those two light color horizontal lines. Uh, those were the runways for the airport. This was also an important airfield during World War II. In this particular article, it says during 1944, 
Some 225 military and cross-country personal aircraft visited Bakersfield. Civil Air Patrol planes from several communities utilized its facilities for several events, including maneuvering and demonstrations. And here we have one of those demonstrations. Parachute jumping, aeroplanes, air cadet training, Bakersfield on Black River and the Strawberry Lane. And it gives a date. This was actually a 1945 ad. Summer Field Maneuvers, Civil Air Patrol, Port Huron Squadron, Detroit Parachute Squadron. Make this your glorious fourth. You buy them, we'll fly them. Bring your lunch and come in the morning when the planes arrive. They'll be here from every point of the compass. Demonstrations, air raids, and of airport military and flying techniques. Admission, 50 cents. Under 18, 25 cents. Free parking on the field just not on the runway. Entrance to field at visitor's own risk. Here's an ad put out by Bakersfield in 1949. Keep flying, America. Attention flyers, prompt courteous service, close to town beaches and golf courses, prompt taxi service, chartered flights, flight instructions. Check with us for flights in and out of Canada. Seaplane landings on Black River. Well, that had me thinking, how in the world would they do that? You know, you may have a little boat out there or something in the way that you come into land. I guess the only thing I can figure out is you do a flyover and everything looks clear. You land. And where would you land? Black River has a lot of turns in it. Well, looking down from this satellite uh, map, probably the only straight uh, straightaway uh, would be this section right here between the two stars. At least that's my assumption. In this article here in 1946, Mr. Baker was very serious about expanding his seaplane business. It says here, due to its location on a bend of the river, Baker's Field offers landing facilities for small seaplanes. It also has several runways for the accommodation of conventional type land planes. Inability to obtain construction materials is holding up the addition of more hangars, of which the airport now has eight. Among plans for the future are projected seaplane hangars with ramps running into the river to enable owners to pull their craft in and out of the weather rather than anchor them to a float in the open water as is commonly done. In this article here, which was published in World War II, it talks about the importance of the Civil Air Patrol here in Port Huron. It reads, a British officer stationed at Gross Isle Naval Air Training Base lost his bearing while practicing high-altitude acrobatics. Howard Welch, member of the Civil Air Patrol in Port Huron, noticed his plight and led the officer to a safe landing at Baker's Field. Subsequently, Gross Isle sent two ships to Baker's to escort the Englishman to his base. In this incident, which but recently came to light, is told the story of Port Huron's Civil Air Patrol and the service it has been organized to perform in the war. Similar groups dot the nation. Since Colonel E.A. Evans of the Army Air Corps directed the establishment of the patrol here a year ago as an Army Auxiliary, some 50 men and women representing several phases of air service have signed as members. Among them are pilots, mechanics, various technicians, nurses, photographers, and representatives of the medical profession. The group has 10 pilots and six planes ready for patrol service. Pilots may be called on at any time to transport men or vital materials to strategic points. Other activities of the group include the spotting of fallen aircraft, learning to identify passing planes, blackout service, and ground school instruction for CAP cadets. Even after the war, military planes were making emergency landings at Baker's Field. As you can see from this article here from 1955, Navy plane finds haven on local airfield. Near out of gas, pilot manages tricky landing. A single engine light bomber, an AD Sky Raider, making a return flight with another plane to Gross Isle Air Base from Norfolk, Virginia, made a forced landing at Baker's Field about 6 p.m. Tuesday. No one was injured and the plane was not damaged. The pilot, Lieutenant K.D. Matson, and a passenger, Seaman Jerry Clark, was making his first airplane flight returning home on leave 
from Norfolk, Virginia. He returned to Dearborn in his father's car late Tuesday. So what happened? Ralph goes on to say this. Circling Cross Isle for a landing, the two planes were ordered to Selfridge Air Force Base because too many civilian aircraft were waiting to land. On the flight to Selfridge, low visibility caused Matson to miss the field and he found himself over Lake Huron. Money low on gas, he returned to the Michigan shoreline at Lexington. Choosing the nearest port on his map, Bakersfield, he approached the 2,800 feet runway to land. On the last 100 feet of the runway, the 18,000 pound aircraft hit a section which had been soaked by melting snow in the afternoon. It bogged down, thus avoiding a crash at the edge of the field. It had less than 10 gallons of gas remaining, or about six minutes cruising time. The other plane set down safely at Selfridge without enough gas to get down the runway. Patson took off at 8.25 today for Gross Isle after the plane was towed from the mire by two local wrecking trucks. Selfridge airmen guarded the plane overnight. In 1949, a bad storm went through the area. And it says here, district cleans up storm wreckage. And it did some damage at uh, the Baker Airfield of a, uh, just mainly a plane. This uh, former Navy training craft was torn loose from its moorings uh, during the windstorm and smashed beyond repair. Harold Baker said that the wind, which is estimated at 80 miles an hour, cartwheeled the plane across the field despite extra mooring lines which had been attached. None of the other 11 planes on the premises was damaged. And as we scroll down here, we can see uh, a roof torn off a furniture company in Bad Axe, but I want to get to this bottom one. I thought this was interesting. Uh, it says these are errant boxcars which made a run Wednesday under wind power from a spur, uh, Grizzle Road, across the city to come to rest near the Dunn Sulfite Paper Company. Stopped by running into a heavy carload of nails. The metal ends acted as the sails and under the pressure of a 75 mile an hour wind were blown along the Grand Trunk Railroad tracks. The cars whipped past 10 street crossings in the city without warning and only by luck and hasty setting up of police and sheriff guards was an accident with some motorists avoided. There were very few night flights going into the airport mainly because there was no lighting along the airstrip. If you flew in at night, the runway had to be lit with sponge pots. Sometimes Mr. Baker would park a car at each end of the runway and flash the light so pilots could land. But they also had a beacon that would flash first a white light, then a green light continuously. If a pilot in a small aircraft lost their way, that beacon would guide them to safety. For about 40 years, that aging beacon helped pilots find their way to Bakersfield. The airport closed in 1976. For about 20 years, the beacon's tower was the only sign that an airport ever existed in the Black River floodplain, west of Pine Grove Avenue. In this article, it says, that last bit of history connecting the state's first airport, its unique owner and his former home, came toppling down last week when a Lapeer Museum lay claim to the rotating light. The beacon will be refurbished and housed at the Air Museum under construction near Lapeer County Airport. And once that beacon was gone, there wasn't any sign that an airport ever existed here. The property lay dormant for quite some time. And then there was talk about putting condos there, and of course the people complained, and they didn't. And then there was talk about putting a park there, and the people complained, but they decided to put it to a vote. And after voting, it was 5-1 against putting a park there. So they lost that battle as well. And that was in 1995. But in 2001, they were able to get a state grant that took care of most of the cost, and Fort Huron Township would have their park without a big increase in taxes. In 1979, Harold J. Baker passed away, but he certainly left a legacy on this area. I wonder how many people have gone by this sign and wondered 
Why is there a plane on that sign? But if you're from my generation, you know what that plane means. Today, when you go down Pine Grove and look across Black River, this is pretty much what you see, the park. But at one time, you saw this. Boats docked along Black River in docking that belonged to uh, Mr. Baker. And then the airfield right behind as we zoom in. This is an amazing photograph because there aren't many pictures of Baker's Field. So we're very happy to have it. And as we look down here, you'll see uh, the photo credit for it. Before the park, before the airfield, before the boat company, this is what it looked like. As the years go by, things certainly do change. <laughs>